uh, I open this academic ceremony in which Mr. Marius Kowalewski will defend the academic thesis extracorporeal membrane oxygenation support in complex clinical scenarios of refractory cardiogenic shock in adults. And I, I of course, uh, welcome the candidate and wish him luck. And I welcome also the, uh, the supervisors, uh, that is Professor Loriso, Professor Maas, and, and Dr. Bidar. Of course, the opponents, who you will see very soon. And of course, all uh, family and friends who are watching this ceremony online. Uh, Mr. Kowalewski, you have the floor for a maximum of 15 minutes to present what you have written in your thesis. The floor is yours. Distinguished uh, Mr. Prorector, uh, dear members of the assessment committee, members of the Corona, uh, dear opponents, dear guests, uh, it's my great honor and privilege to be led to present to you the results um, of the thesis entitled Extracorporal Membrane Oxygenation Support in uh, Complex Clinical Scenarios of Refractory Cardiogenic Shock in Adults. Uh, my name is Mariusz Kowalewski, I'm a cardiac surgeon, and again, thank you uh, for this very opportunity. Heart diseases represent the most common and relevant cause of death worldwide, and these diseases range from uh, benign to life-threatening and include, among others, uh, coronary disease, valvular disease, heart failure, and arrhythmias. At worst of these conditions, uh, may cause a development of cardiogenic shock, which is a loss of myocardial contractility as seen on the right in this very same patient. In the left uh, side corner is a left ventricle uh, contracting in a normal way. Uh, and, did, and then on the right, the very same patient and the left ventricle uh, compromised, so not contracting, uh, not contracting too well. Uh, cardiogenic shock, by definition is a situation in which compensating mechanisms are no longer mm, capable of ensuring adequate uh, blood flow to other uh, vital organs. SKY criteria divide cardiogenic shock to five phases and different levels of uh, severity. To clinicians, uh, other approach is uh, more, other approach and definitions are um, yet more important. Cardiogenic shock is managed with uh, medication, which are also first-line treatment. For patients in uh, refractory cardiogenic shock, which is uh, the topic of the uh, topic of the current project, mm, that means shock non-responding to highest dose of um, adequate medication and signs of persistent hyperperfusion, uh, mechanical circulatory support is now treatment of choice. Uh, the choice of mechanical uh, circulatory support is dependent on several factors, including the indications and patient condition, but before all, it's uh, availability, ease of employment, and readiness of use. For this reason, uh, venoarterial ECMO, that stands for uh, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, is widely adopted and applied. It's a circuit consisting of pumps and cannulas that drain uh, venous blood from the patient. Oxygenator enriches the blood in oxygen, and then the pump uh, puts the puts the blood back with arterial line uh, to the patient under pressure. Uh, providing cardiopulmonary uh, bypass for the compromised heart. And ECMO can be instituted uh, by peripheral or central access, depending on patient condition and underlying uh, disease. We have observed an exponential growth of ECMO use in uh, recent years, as also reflected in the ELSO, that is Extracorporeal Life Support Organization Registry. Uh, however, ECMO is uh, extremely extensive, uh, expensive, and resource-consuming therapy reserved for critically ill in whom all conventional uh, measures have all failed. It's not free from uh, complications, including 
bleeding and strokes, which makes uh, the results of such therapy not encouraging. Complications are uh, particularly present in the elderly patients, ECMO after cardiac surgery or ECMO implanted in real uh, emergency. Indeed, uh, particular complex scenarios, uh, complex clinical scenarios have been proposed in which the role of ECMO has been perceived as uh, limited or at least controversial. To our notion, these uh, require further discussion and uh, elucidation. And uh, I focus the current uh, research project, the current PhD to address these scenarios. And they include uh, elderly patients, uh, left ventricle unloading strategies, post-cardiac surgery shock or post-cardiotomy shock, uh, venoarterial ECMO in different surgical status, and ECMO results in relation to heart transplantation, uh, heart transplantation availability and ECMO uh, volume of the treating uh, center. To begin with, uh, elderly patients have never been good candidates for ECMO therapy since advanced age carries a burden of major comorbidities. ECMO has been uh, reluctantly instituted in this, uh, in this group of patients and the outcomes reported and in particular uh, survival are poor. In the analysis of uh, 2,600 patients uh, from the ELSO registry, however, we showed a growing number of ECMOs implanted in patients over 70 years of age with rather stable mortality rates. Uh, indeed, the success uh, of ECMO as described by the possibility to remove the system or weaning from support and mortality rates are pretty much the same across patients uh, in advanced age groups. We could not identify an age as an independent uh, mortality uh, factor, mortality predictor, neither did age influence the complications incidence in this group, uh, in this group of patients. Uh, now, we have indeed proposed a guideline prompting to the use of ECMO in elderly. In fact, uh, patients with acute and severe uh, infection having undergone aortic surgery and already biochemically compromised will most likely uh, die at time of ECMO therapy. Otherwise, carefully selected lower risk individual may still benefit from ECMO and ECMO should be considered and applied uh, in these patients. Cardiopulmonary uh, bypass with heart resting, as is the case in uh, ECMO, carries the risk of left ventricular distension that you see uh, at, the left, at the left side, at the left side um, picture with aortic valve only opening rarely. Uh, this, leads to, uh, this leads to LV distension as that is enlargement of left ventricle. At worst, stagnation of this, uh, of this blood may, uh, may result in formation of left ventricle thrombus uh, that will prevent the heart from expected recovery. Uh, for this reason, several uh, strategies to unload the left ventricle have been proposed, and this includes surgical and percutaneous techniques that either directly or indirectly prevent the left ventricles from uh, overfilling and are employed during ECMO or may be employed during ECMO therapy. In a meta-analysis of 62 uh, studies and over 7,500 patients, uh, we investigated the effects of different strategies of LV unloading on hospital mortality and found that irrespective of unloading strategy, uh, this approach offers 12% mortality reduction. Busy as it seems, and the, at the right side, uh, the figure presents the mortality results of uh, each device assessed. And, this, and it seems that direct surgical uh, left ventricle venting offered uh, highest mortality reduction. Another clinical scenario is postcardiotomy shock. So that is a shock that occurs early after uh, cardiac surgery and includes low cardiac output syndrome, failure to detach or uh, wean from cardiopulmonary bypass while still in the operating room, or sudden cardiac uh, compromise 
while in intensive care uh, unit. One recent analysis of uh, ELSA registry found a disturbing trend for reduced survival in recent, uh, in recent years, uh, which we investigated in depth in our next study. Uh, we found in an analysis of ELSA registry with uh, over 7,000 patients that uh, the, numbers, the, the numbers of ECMOs are increasing annually, but with rather stable mortality uh, trends. On the contrary, what was also intriguing uh, was, that higher, was that higher risk patients, more complex patients and older patients uh, are being treated more willingly in recent years and being uh, offered ECMO postoperatively. Except for uh, heart transplantation group, which uh, yielded highest benefit of post-op uh, ECMO in hospital mortality still outweighs survival with uh, more extensive and complex surgical procedures being associated with poorer uh, prognosis. On the other hand, uh, though we were able to determine survival predictors and among them, the type of cannulation as uh, described before, peripheral versus central was associated with lower mortality in both unadjusted and propensity scored uh, matched uh, statistical uh, models. In uh, another report of uh, 22 studies and 2200 patients, we tested the hypothesis that baseline surgical uh, status before heart surgery, that is uh, elective, urgent, emergency or salvage, are determinants of survival in patients that need ECMO uh, after surgery. Uh, yet in a meta-analysis, no such associations were, were, were found. Indeed, uh, except from lower number of complications in non-emergency setting, uh, mortality rates remain uh, similar, pointing to the fact that ECMO uh, implantation puts all patients at the same risk threshold uh, and works like an equalizer of patient uh, status. Uh, now, in patients undergoing ECMO therapies, several scenarios are uh, possible. Uh, recovery, of course, is the most uh, is the most desired. Uh, when, however, when no improvement is to be uh, is to be seen or is not expected, ECMO will be stopped and withdrawn for uh, futility. Uh, when bridging, however, uh, is an option, or in patients in whom bridging is an option, two strategies are possible, and these are and these include long term uh, assist device or LVAD or heart transplantation. Uh, next two studies will focus on the role of center status and volume and association with outcomes in post-cardiotomy and non-post-cardiotomy setting. Uh, in the first study, we tested the hypothesis that uh, center ECMO volume as a proxy for experience will drive the results in post-cardiotomy ECMO. However, in a meta-analysis with 54 studies and uh, 4,400 patients, we were not able to show any difference with this, uh, with this respect. In another paper, uh, we divided the centers to those who have ventricle assist device program or transplantation program and those uh, who do not perform uh, such procedures. We included 174 studies with 13,000 patients and saw that postcardiotomy shock and acute myocardial infarction were the most, uh, were the most common indications for, uh, for ECMO implantation. Indeed, we found a significantly higher survival in centers who perform uh, ventricle assist device implants, implantations and heart transplants together with lower number, um, now lower number of complications, including most feared uh, neurological, uh, neurological ones. Uh, we believe that um, these results derive from uh, availability uh, of experienced ECMO teams on site, uh, readiness of personalized equipment, quicker diagnosis and management of complications should they, uh, should they occur, together with shorter bridging times and no need of risky transport of such uh, patient. The above 
led to creating an algorithm, the first of its uh, first of its kind, on when to bridge and when to refer a patient to a more uh, more experienced center, uh, provided of course his clinical uh, status is known and not yet uh, compromised. With uh, daily assessment and intensification of uh, VA ECMO if, if necessary by adding a cannula, by selectively supporting right ventricle or putting ECMO in other configurations. Uh, <coughs> and quick bridging and referral when possible, the outcomes uh, of such therapy are likely to, are likely to uh, improve. Mm. To, to summarize, uh, to, to summarize the findings of the of the current uh, of the current research project, uh, so, several points arise that uh, that that deserve uh, that deserve highlighting. For, first of all, uh, VA ECMO, vena arterial ECMO, is not contraindicated in the elderly as it used to be perceived, but criteria should be used for uh, proper patient selection and achieving better results. Left ventricular unloading is uh, certainly linked to improved survival, and uh, importantly, left ventricle unloading by by any by any strategy has the has the potential uh, benefit. Mortality trends uh, in patients uh, having undergone cardiac surgery but requiring ECMO postoperatively are stable, uh, with more elderly and more complex patients uh, being treated. Uh, now, baseline surgical status, an example, elective versus non-elective uh, surgery, has nothing to do with uh, outcomes on uh, venoarterial arterial ECMO postoperatively. There is no outcome, uh, there is no, no effect of uh, VA ECMO volume of, of, a, of a center on outcomes after uh, cardiac surgery uh, in patients that require uh, VA ECMO implantation. However, there is a there is a signal or a certain uh, or a certain sign that uh, these outcomes may be better in patients uh, in patients uh, that are treated in centers routinely performing uh, left ventricle uh, assist device implantation, and in centers who uh, who perform or who have uh, heart transplantation uh, programs. This. Then, then the outcomes are likely to are likely to improve, are likely to be better than in, than in other centers. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. I'm hoping not. Okay. Cost, thank not thank cost. you very much for your presentation. Uh, we have to quickly go to the opposition. We start with the chair of the assessment committee, Professor Van der Horst, who is a professor of intensive care at the Maastricht University Medical Center. Professor Van der Horst. Mr. Candidate, with interest, I read the studies on your thesis and would like to compliment you on your, and your colleagues on the tremendous job of analyzing the LGO registry and the current literature. Furthermore, I would like to compliment your promoters as well. In your thesis, you study the outcome in patients on VA ECMO and conclude that remarkable progress has been made in the last 20 years. Chapter 7 concludes that an apparent difference in survival and weaning after VA ECMO for refractory cardiogenic shock was observed between centers. in hospital survival was worse in centers without a heart transplant and or VET program. Unfortunately, I moved from a heart transplant center to a center without such a program. Therefore, I am curious about the potential underlying drivers. My first question about chapter seven is, which analysis in your study is the analysis underlying the explicit conclusion that the outcome might be worse for patients treated in centers without a heart transplant program. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for, for the question. Indeed, this is very, this is very intriguing. Uh, we, we performed a meta-analysis and, uh, and divided the studies uh, in, in half. Actually, actually, uh, there's uh, the, the, the two groups that we investigated where the uh, where the studies performed in a in a center that has a VAD or transplant program and compared the the outcomes, but uh, but the uh, and compared the outcomes uh, to the, to the centers that do not have 
such uh, that do not have such program. And uh, we we were able to demonstrate that the, that on average the mortality is uh, mortality is higher in the in the centers that uh, do not perform such procedures. In the same time, mortality, although uh, all, all by the difference was uh, the difference was small, it was seven or eight percent, yet statistically significant, was lower in the in the centers uh, that have these uh, these programs on site. Uh, noteworthy, uh, the, the meta the meta analysis um, with that that addressed this issue um, included all patients with cardiogenic shock. Therefore, included both post cardiotomy and non post cardiotomy uh, settings. Um, for this reason, the heterogeneity or uh, the differences between patients uh, patient selection and other biases might, uh, might, have, might have arised in, in the meta-analysis and the results are not to be uh, generalized to, to the entire patient population. Uh, in fact, before, before a randomized clinical trial, or randomized trial of any kind is, uh, is performed, we will not know that for sure. Uh, what we know is, only comes from uh, retrospective uh, registry, from my uh, observational data, and uh, with all the underlying biases and disadvantages of such approach. Can uh, I ask you a, a question about the bias? You analyzed your study uh, based on the Robins 1-2. Can you tell me what is overall low risk of bias? Uh, dear, dear opponent, uh, thank you. Thank you again for uh, thank you again for the opportunity to uh, to clarify. Uh, it's uh, it's a tool to assess uh, to assess the risk of bias in observational in observational studies. This was uh, this was only available recently. Before that, new before before that was available. Uh, Newcastle Ottawa scale or uh, or other scales were used to assess bias. Uh, this is a matrix of several components uh, that uh, that consists of um, that 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 are used to assess uh, basically the quality quality of the study and the, the and the uh, comparability of the of the groups addressed uh, addressed uh, in, inside the study. It it assesses both the design, the methodology, and uh, the reporting of outcomes in, in the study. And one, uh, one researcher, or uh, if only that's possible, uh, more researchers are all, to, um, are all to perform the tests uh, by, by the Robbins, uh, by the Robbins uh, criteria, and that they're assessing single, single studies one, uh, one at a time. If, the methodology of a, of a study is sound. The results are uh, reported completely. There is no signs of uh, no signs of publication bias. In a sense, uh, the the treatment group, the control group, were chosen uh, were chosen wisely. Sound. Uh, they were uh, they were chosen so to uh, reflect the general general practice. Uh, inclusion exclusion criteria were uh, were explicitly stated. Then the study is uh, rated low risk uh, low risk of bias. On contrary, yeah. Th yeah. yeah, thank you for the sake of time. I think, uh, thank you very much for this answer. I want to make one remark. I think that if one of the bias domains is not low, the overall conclusion that there is low risk of bias can't stand true. So I liked your sensitivity analysis, but I think it could even be more detailed if you uh, clarify the low risk of bias better. But thank you very much for your nice comments. Thank you, Professor van der Horst. We now go to the second member of the assessment committee, and that's Professor de Sommer. And uh, he's a, a professor in uh, perfusion technology in the University of Ghent. And thank you, uh, Professor de Sommer, for coming all the way from Ghent. You have a few minutes for opposition. Uh, Mr. Candidate, first of all, I would also like to congratulate you and your supervisors for the very nice work you have made. However, I have to have to ask you a question and I would like to go back to two major conclusions. One you said, and that I believe it's an important one, that you can perform also in older patients 
VA ECMO, even if the morbidity of those patients is low. Then I'm mainly interested in what you showed in your guidelines being the orange group, the group where we actually could consider it. Then I go to a second conclusion you made, and that was the difference, as was mentioned by the previous opponent, between um, centers who actually have heart transplantation and those who don't have. Could it be that the type of management in the latter centers, which is really focused on bad ventricles because of the huge uh, follow-up of uh, LVAT patients, will manage more the afterload reduction in these patients? Whereas in other centers, and especially in the healthy heart, one is mainly focused on preload, as this heart will respond mostly to that. So my question is, would that be a potential uh, explanation in combination with the fact of cannulation technique? You mentioned in your work that peripheral cannulation is probably uh, the best choice. But in a patient with severe bad heart, where you have a post-cardiotomy, wouldn't it be better to have an aortic cannulation where you actually control much better the afterload? So my question is the management and especially focusing on the physiology of a bad heart, might that make the difference between those centers which are seeing more heart failure patients on a routine base compared to other centers? Uh, this distinguished opponent, uh, Mr. Professor, uh, Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely agree. I can't, I can't agree more. And uh, there is, there are inherent differences in the in the centers and patient profiles um, in treated in centers with heart transplantation program and patients treated uh, outside those uh, those facilities. That's beyond uh, that's beyond uh, doubt. And we also pointed to that uh, differences uh, in our in our paper. Uh, coming, coming to your, coming back to your sec second question, which is, uh, which is uh, also a very insightful comment, and uh, and the future future research will certainly uh, will certainly address that. Is uh, is that of course we fear uh, we we fear uh, to put the patient on uh, venous arterial ECMO in particular with peripheral access when there is signs of. Um, LV damage, and uh, this this is, this is this is only because we fear uh, Harlequin syndrome with uh, VA with VA ECMO in a peripheral mode, with uh, with um, with a higher or with the or with the upper upper part of a body uh, being uh, being prone to uh, deoxygenated uh, blood from. Uh, <coughs> Being being prone to deoxygenated uh, blood coming from coming from the heart. Uh, now, what's uh, what's uh, what's what's important? What's important uh, as prom promptly as you say, central cannulation in patients with uh, with post cardiotomy post cardiotomy shock uh, seems seems to be more uh, more more addressing the physiological needs needs of a patient. And only if we can uh, only if we can. Um, if we can see it or foresee it early in the OR that this patient will uh, will require will require ECMO. There is troubles uh, troubles weaning from cardiopulmonary bypass. There is low cardiac output syndrome, and we still have the cannulas. Uh, we still have cannulas in in the heart. Uh, it may be better not to uh, not to force uh, medications in this uh, in this patient to to make him wean from cardiopulmonary bypass. But maybe maybe it's also better to leave the cannulas in place, uh, switch between cardiopulmonary bypass or uh, extracorporeal circulation machine to VA ECMO and uh, grant this patient an opportunity for one day or 48 hours even uh, of support for the uh, for the compromised for the compromised myocardium. That's uh, that's for sure very important, and is called a prophylactic ECMO. Um, Concept and is uh, well to my, uh, to my to my notion, but hopefully this will be this will be introduced for the for the highest risk patients and will certainly will certainly play a role in these uh, in these patients. Uh, rega regarding regarding the uh, regarding the profile uh, of the uh, of the decompensated uh, decompensated patients in cardiogenic shock 
and the relation to, um, to the facilities in transplant, non-transplant centers, uh, that's uh, even that's even clearer now. Of course, of, of course, it may it may seem so that uh, that the centers that um, that the centers that perform uh, left ventricle assist devices uh, implantation will address uh, afterload more vigorously, more uh, more uh, will willingly than than the than the centers that only maybe not only focus on stabilizing the patient, but this is their main uh, main goal, just to sta stabilize the patient and then uh, probably they uh, they may refer the patient to more experienced. Mr. Uh, Candidate, sorry to interrupt you. You answered my question very well, but in the sake of time, uh, I think we have to go to the next opponent. Thank you, Professor De Sommer. Then we come to the third opponent, also from abroad and thank you for coming uh, professor Buchen, who's also a member of the assessment committee for the university of dusseldorf and i want to ask the candidate to keep the the answers concise uh, professor Buchen. yeah thank you mr candidate first of all i would like to thank you for this very comprehensive and interesting presentation you really described all relevant topics around ecmo treatment i would like to go to chapter Two with my first question regarding the age of the patients. Um, you described the age and the results uh, with regard to the age, but in our recent uh, S3 guideline in Germany for VA ECMO in cardiocirculatory failure, failure, we did not define a clear contraindication for VA ECMO with regard to age. Which further parameters to decide for or against ECMO would you suggest, particularly in older patients? Um the distinguished opponent, uh, dear Professor Buchen, uh, thank you, thank you again for this uh, for this question. Indeed, indeed, the uh, elderly patients uh, are are not uh, are not very well uh, very well defined uh, defined group. Not because their age is not defined. We can easily define it, and this and the elderly are most commonly defined as patients over seventy years of age. Uh, they're not uh, precisely defined because their comorbidities uh, are different and the patients differ from one, from one another. We have a seven year old that is malnourished, that is uh, fra fragile or in uh, having the highest scores on frailty, uh, on frailty uh, scoring indices. And we have a vigorous 80 year old that can uh, undergo complex cardiac surgery procedures that may even uh, that may that may even suffer from acute myocardial infarction and acute heart failure and then recover recover quickly and without uh, without sequelae. So elderly is not homogeneous. That's um, that's for sure. And. Uh, we investigated the mortality uh, prognostic factors in the in the ELSA registry. Uh, the registry, however, uh, however biggest available and however uh, comprehensive it, it is, uh, it has certain limitations. One of uh, limitations of the ELSA registry, it does not collect all the variables that uh, we would like to address um, for, for sure. Uh, for sure, there is a field of, of field for improvement in terms of uh, variables that define patient baseline characteristics. Also, the variables that define exactly the type of uh, type of surgical procedures, the um, the duration of cardiopulmonary bypass, the duration of uh, cross clamping of the aorta, they will all make uh, they will all make a difference, and we could not address them in our analysis. What we did, however, was uh, we took uh, we took the uh, we took we took the data that uh, that were available, and from this data we uh, we tried to uh, we tried to determine the uh, survival predictors. We similarly to the to the to the other project, we we created a matrix in which uh, in which we define. Uh, the duration of duration of support, biochemical status, um, acidosis, uh, having or not having complications uh, while on treatment, and uh, we were able to we were able to um, define three groups. 
of elderly patients, one that will more, most likely benefit from ECMO, one uh, that will likely benefit from ECMO and ECMO should be considered in those patients, and the third, the patients that are most critically, uh, most critically ill, most critically compromised, uh, in whom ECMO will, uh, will likely fail. Um, Age was not uh, was not uh, identified as as an independent predictor, and uh, the very same division could be applied to uh, patients uh, in, in younger counterparts in, in in patients at younger age. The very same criteria will probably uh, will probably apply and be and be valid. Uh, other than type of surgery, other than uh, duration of support. Uh, yeah, of course, the mal malnourishment, uh, baseline status, uh, biochemical status, blood gases, uh, ventilator parameters, uh, they were all taken into consideration and uh, these uh, are most likely to affect patient, uh, patient survival while on ECMO. Okay, uh, and thank you. One second. And hey, I'm afraid there is no time for a second question. Thank okay. you very much for your position. We have seven opponents and uh, we want okay, to okay. give everybody the floor. Thank you very much, Professor Buchen. Then we come to the fourth opponent, who's a member of the assessment committee as well. That's Professor Van Moek, who is a, a, a professor in professional development in medical postgraduate training, in particular intensive care medicine in the Maastricht University Medical Center. And he has also accepted the role of secretary today, for which I'm very grateful. Professor Van Moek. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Pro Rector. Uh, dear candidate, uh, again, my congratulations on uh, a 300 page thesis. Um, uh, a job well done, a job well done by your supervising team, your co supervisor, and your two supervisors. Um, I had a question very comparable to my, the, the previous opponent uh, regarding uh, age, um, but you also uh, already answered that question. It's on chapter five, the VA ECMO uh, chapter for PCS. Um, and there you uh, explain that mortality on ECMO for PCS remained stable, complications rate decrease, and yet elder patients were supported. Am I correct? Yes. Right. Um, and of my first remark would be that studying mortality um, is perhaps not so sufficient because in the same chapter, you also alluded to the fact that almost half of the patient that were ultimately weaned from ECMO died in hospital in the previous studies, your figures were slightly better. Uh, however, you also uh, discussed morbidity, frailty status of the patient, uh, ADL independence previously. Um, so very much comparable to the previous speaker, I had a question, well, what would be the role for patient selection, patient selection regarding the primary operation, patient selection for VA ECMO placement. Um, my first question would have been on the age of the patient, uh, but you also already answered that question. Um, but is this, um, are, are these DN, uh, um, uh, do not me mechanical circular, uh, circulatory support orders, are they something to discuss by the cardiac surgeon alone? Or you do, all, do you also envision a role for the intensivist? Could we decide these issues in a multidisciplinary manner? Distinguished uh, opponent, this is uh, cert certainly this is certainly very insightful, and uh, of, of course, of course, I agree that uh, I agree that coming coming to your coming to your second thought uh, and, se and second question, the the cooperation with intensivists uh, is of is of paramount. Uh, is of paramount importance. Uh, of course, when when in the OR we feel uh, we feel empowered to decide to decide whether whether the patient requires ECMO or not, whether he's feasible, uh, whether it's feasible to wean this patient from CPB or not. While the patient is in the ICU is uh, so, so to say all yours. And of course, we're uh, we're always eager to uh, we're always eager to 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 support uh, to support intensivists um, in in in, the, in this manner because uh, they they dealing with the patient and uh, it's uh, it's it should be it should be our common uh, it should be our common uh, decision. So of course there is there is a role for uh, there is a role for intensivists in uh, in 
in timing and the selection and the selection of uh, patient for um, for ECLS uh, support. Now uh, coming to coming to the first question. So what are the other uh, selection? Uh, what are the other selection criteria? Uh, and in particular in post cardiotomy uh, setting. Well, we we don't we don't know that. We only uh, we only uh, we we only have the have the data of retrospective. Uh, nature. We uh, know the experiences of other centers, and uh, now that the guidelines, uh, the, 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 the guidelines became available, they uh, shed new light on the on the topic of postcardiotomy uh, VA ECMO, and they define a certain criteria in whom uh, in whom the VA ECMO support will uh, most likely will most likely work, not not benefit. But most likely work, and these are and these are very these are very uh, these are very strict. Right. However, may I interrupt? May I interrupt you for the sake of time? Because obviously, it's, you you can answer that question really well, I think. Um, but should we not anticipate and discuss these issues in the outpatient setting? And do you see a role for the intensivist or another member of the multi multidisciplinary team there? Very short question. Uh, a very short answer, please. Thank you. Thank you. Of of course, I've never I've never seen it I've, I've never seen it done discussing uh, discussing ECMO possibilities in outpatients. But I would love to I'd love to see I'd love to see it. I'd love to experience that. It may it may be it may be yeah very good choice. Thank you for your answer and for the sake of time, I'll head back to the prorector. Okay. Thank you, Professor van Mo. Now we come to the following opponent, who's uh, and that's uh, Dr. Sardari. He is a cardiac surgeon in the Maastricht University Medical Center. Dr. Sardari. As a candidate, I would like to congratulate you uh, with your uh, work and also your supervisors. I have two questions. The first questions, uh, question is regards to the chapter two. In hospital mortality of ECMO in elderly is uh, very high, around 68%, considering that this finding is based on ELSO registry. So a registry which is voluntary and uh, which is actually from uh, centers with, uh, with more experience. Is it fair to say that this mortality rate is an underestimation? And if so, what is the consequence of that? regarding to the decision-making um, of um, using ECMO in elderly, especially in centers that are not um, super specialized. Distinguished opponent, uh, doctor, uh, completely, completely agree. Uh, we've seen uh, we, we've seen not not in the ELSO registry, but when performing uh, other uh, other analysis as well that reporting of outcomes in centers uh, that that have outcomes not so encouraging, so to say, is lower. Uh, I expect that uh, centers who perform ECMO but uh, do not have encouraging results will less likely contribute to the uh, ELSO. Also, registry. Therefore, it's uh, it's uh, very fair to say that mortality scores, uh, mortality rates in the Elso registry uh, are underestimated. Uh, and uh, and I and I totally I totally agree. In the same time, we were able to demonstrate that the survival rates were higher in the more experienced center. Therefore, the centers that um, contribute more, more records, more patients to, to the registry. Um, going, to your, going to your second, second question, and also as a natural, natural consequence, it's, um, it, it may be, it may be uh, fair to say as well that uh, referring patients uh, in cardiogenic shock, not necessarily in post-cardiotomy cardiogenic shock, may be a treatment of uh, a, a treatment of choice for for, for the patients in uh, non non transplant and uh, non uh, bad implanting center. Uh, it may be a choice for the for these patients because mortality rates uh, reported there uh, are likely to be are likely to be uh, lower than in than in the in the outside centers, so to say. 
Thank you for your answer. I'm satisfied. Um, I think uh, the most important issue is that you need some dedication and centralization uh, with this patient's group. Uh, the second question is regarding the chapter five. Um, there is a significant tr trend towards the use of ECMO in postcardiotomy patients. And the um, largest fraction um, is uh, uh, attributed to cabbage patient. Uh, if you consider that and consider the fact that we have a trend of lower uh, decrease of cabbage uh, during the same time frame, can you explain that? Considering the fact that cabbage is also not, not the most complicated uh, procedures that we do in cardiac surgery. Thank you. Thank you again for this uh, for this question. Again, uh, as with uh, as with the registry um, or regi registries, there is certain there's certain limitations to the registry. The cabbage procedures uh, in the ELSA registry are uh, also not as well defined as we would like them as we would like them to be. Uh, we only know if the patient before cabbage underwent a acute myocardial infarction. Uh, but we do not know anything, anything else. We do not know the timing. We do not know uh, if he had undergone PCI. We do not know if the PCI uh, was, a, was a failure or it was, it, was it successful and uh, the cardiogenic shock occurred, uh, occurred afterwards. Uh, for the for the patients uh, who underwent cabbage, I, uh, I'm I'm not really I'm not really um, I'm not really willing willing to say that uh, these were these were elective elective first time first time cabbage because uh, cabbage as the as the most commonly performed procedure or cardiac procedure worldwide in uh, selected low risk patients very very rarely very very seldom uh, requires ecmo and for for this reason um, a uh, decreasing trend in the general number of cabbage procedures will uh, not likely uh, will not likely affect the numbers of uh, the numbers of ecmo post cabbage uh, to my uh, to, to well at least in my opinion uh, however with uh, with the advance of PCI and treating uh, most severe and uh, most complex lesions and most uh, most complex patients, uh, also also the complications and uh, number of uh, and the number of cardiogenic shock um, that will occur uh, after cardiac surgery uh, for uh, for for PCI or cardiac surgery post PCI. If, if that was the case, uh, may may likely may likely uh, grow or or increase in numbers. Okay, thank you for your answer. I'm satisfied. Thank, thank you me. very much, Dr. Sadari. Now we come to the following opponent, and that is Professor Mochtar, who is an emeritus professor in cardiothoracic surgery in the Maastricht University Medical Center. Professor Mochtar, Mr. Candidate. You did a thorough analysis of uh, ECMO in also in post-cardiotomy patients. But I have a question about the, uh, the non-post-cardiotomy setting. Uh, mostly non-post-cardiotomy settings are, are done, in my opinion, in non-transplant centers. And these non-transplant centers have less experience. So my uh, question is, is the, is there for the future the need for a risk scoring system uh, in this patient setting, especially for patient selection, uh, advanced ECMO management and ECMO experience? For example, if you have peripheral uh, uh, cannulation via uh, uh, ECMO, there are many complications can, can start, such as the Harlequin syndrome, uh, the patients need LV unloading, and sometimes there is also a combination of venovenous arterial ECMO. Are these centers experienced enough in, in, in non-cardiotomy setting to do this? Can you give me some answers on this? 
Um, this distinguished opponent, uh, thank you, thank you for this remark, and it certainly certainly deserves uh, deserves to be uh, uh, to, to be to be clarified, elucidated. Uh, of course, uh, of course, I, I agree that um, the the concept of uh, of uh, dynamically changing ECMO configurations, of adding a cannula, of uh, transition between uh, of transitioning between the configurations from VV to VA, from VV to VVA, is not widely uh, is not widely adopted, or was not widely adopted in non postcardiotomy in non postcardiotomy setting, and in particular, it was not widely adopted in centers not experienced in, uh, in ECMO, that's, uh, that's for sure. Um, it, came, uh, it came as a, as a, as a surprise that with, uh, that with the recent COVID-19 pandemic and uh, in, in the centers that do not perform, um, that do not perform routinely uh, such, such procedures as uh, VAD implantations or heart transplant, suddenly number of ECMOs uh, in VV uh, or in initial VV configuration have, uh, have expanded dramatically. And so was, uh, so was the story in, uh, in our center. So we've, we have performed over 120 uh, ECMOs for uh, COVID-19 um, acute respiratory distress. And it seemed that in, in some patients, VV ECMO, was, uh, VV ECMO was not enough because of their um, cardiac deterioration or because they had a cardiac condition that only, became, uh, that only became symptomatic while the patient was on ECMO. And then, uh, of course, there was an element of, uh, there was an element of learning curve, but we employed uh, the uh, vigilant, uh, vigilant um, uh, assessment, daily, daily assessment of the patient needs, and uh, we adopted these strategies of transitioning to more advanced, more complex uh, configurations, and uh, with with better outcomes. I'm I'm uh, really far from from declaring that non transplant centers should not should not do that for the for the reason being lack of experience. The experience is to be experience is is to be gained with uh, with more and more uh, more and more ECMO cases, as was the case with uh, as was the case with COVID nineteen. The, the the main issue or the main difference uh, between between the centers and probably the one driving driving the difference uh, is the shorter is the shorter bridging times is the time to decision about uh, about when to bridge the patient not uh, not really about uh, intensif intensification of intensification of uh, ECMO support well at least at least uh, at least in my opinion thank you for your answer but I want to add one, one question more uh, in, in the COVID pandemic there was a lot of patient selection, uh, let's say bias, but also discussion because of the research, research consumption of the ICU uh, facility. So uh, my, my question is, in, in these centers, it's especially uh, a, 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 a multidisciplinary approach needed between Intensive, intensive care doctors, cardiac surgeons, interventional cardiologists, for example, to do a transcentral septal LV unloading from the left atrium, and so on. So, uh, selection is, for example, for age, but in fact, selection on research consumption. Do you agree on that? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. I remember, I remember uh, in the middle of March. We were pushed to the we were pushed to the limits. There were 16 ECMOs, 16 ECMOs running in the in the in our department, and uh, no matter what we no matter what we what we do, uh, we could not uh, put another patient uh, put another patient on ECMO, which we which we uh, thought at this time was our failure to uh, to, pro to provide best possible care. But uh, yeah, this 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 happened, and I imagine this happened not only. Uh, not only in our in our center, but uh, yes, I, I agree that uh, patient selection uh, patient selection is crucial in this uh, in this in this regard, and uh, to uh, to offer ECMO only for only to patients that will 
most likely benefit from ECMO uh, is of course to be is of course to be um, pursued. However, this is always an ethical dilemma that, uh, that nobody uh, or that is that is very hard for anyone involved. Thank you. Thank you for your answer. Thank you, Professor Mochtar, for your opposition. We now come to the following opponent, that's Professor Suwalski. He is a cardiac surgeon in the University of Warsaw in Poland. And thank you, Professor Suwalski, for coming all the way, albeit online, from Poland. Uh, thank you, Mr. Prorector. Um, it's a great honor to be here and to participate. Uh, Mr. Candidate, thank you very much for uh, your very comprehensive analysis. I think it's, uh, it, has, it, it is very interesting and actually very much needed since this field is very much growing. And uh, also compliments to the supervisor, supervisors who are undoubtedly great author authorities in the field. Uh, so I have uh, one question, I would say uh, uh, two questions in one, uh, because uh, analyzing the, 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 first of all, the data uh, very thoroughly, and on the other hand, with your personal experience, I'd like to know, um, first of all, uh, what are your thoughts on the needs of new technology on the, on the directions of improvement? And actually, which is very much on the contrary, con con uh, connected with uh, the next question, what is the Achilles heel in the moment? Which, what is the, because of course, this is a very difficult uh, area with high mortality, lots of, uh, lots of complications. Also selection as, as it was meant, but, uh, but I'd like to hear a few thoughts on, uh, on, the, on the technology status. Uh, what are your thoughts? Distinguished opponent, dear Mr. P Professor, uh, thank you, thank you for the thank you for the opportunity. Uh, with the recent uh, advancements, we were able to go further and push the ECMO beyond the beyond the barriers that we faced uh, only ten years ago. We have uh, new oxygenators, new cannulas, new uh, new centrifugal pumps that are way different from the, from the ECMO described in the uh, early 1970s by Barlett in the uh, New England Journal. Uh, we, we, minimized, we minimized the technology. First of all, we made it uh, mobile. The ECMO device is no longer, is no longer uh, the, size of a, the size of a wardrobe uh, taking, taking half of the ICU. Uh, it's mobile. It, patient on ECMO can be transported both in an ambulance or in a helicopter. Uh, can be moved to another facility. Can be cannulated out uh, outside of the center and then bring, brought back um, brought back to the um, to the um, uh, extra corporal uh, life support center. That's uh, that's uh, one thing. Then the cannulas have changed and made a dramatic progress. We now have single lumen. Uh, single double lumen cannulas that uh, that uh, have the function of both draining and putting the blood back in the patient. In the same time, they only they only have one access one access port instead of two, therefore reducing the number of uh, number of complications that go with it, like bleeding, like uh, vascular tear, like dissections and. Uh, and others. We have types of cannulas, uh, like the re most recent ones, like uh, Protec, uh, Protec Duo, that is a cannula designed to address selectively right ventricle only. Uh, it's, it happens that after LVAD implantation, the right ventricle alone is failing, and uh, the risk of reopening the, reopening the chest and uh, putting the patient back on ECC is prohibitive. We may refer to this cannula that is uh, that is inserted percutaneously and that serves as a uh, as a right ventricle only assist device. If the oxygenation uh, is not um, is not um, is not pleasing is not pleasing us at the moment, one can attach an oxygenator to uh, to this protect duo um, to this protect duo uh, cannula and tandem heart pump and end up with oxy that is a system of 
uh, providing support for right ventricle alone, in the same time oxygenating, uh, oxygenating the blood. Coming uh, to your uh, coming to your second second question, um, that was uh, not the uh, that was not the te technology, but um, but uh, <coughs> but. Uh, on how to uh, how to impl implement right this uh, the technologies in the uh, in uh, no I, I I I wanted to know your thoughts what what is the Achilles heel at the moment if you had a, a magic wand or Sorry. maybe you have some ideas what would you change to uh, at this moment uh, in the technology what is your observation. Well, the only the only Achilles heel uh, of uh, VA uh, ECMO support, uh, to my mind, is the timing. Uh, the time the time is the crucial player. The time of implantation, the time of decision, the timing of bridging, the timing of referral, and the timing of changing configurations to more uh, to more advanced or to more uh, complex. Uh, this is decisive uh, to all the to all the dilemmas that we that we now have. We have the equipment. We have the experienced staff. We have uh, great intensivists and uh, great cardiac surgeons as well. The, the only the only thing that we that we need is to be on time with our uh, with our with our treatment and uh, probably daily daily assessment daily. Um, vigilant uh, assessment of patient's condition of patient status uh, is enough and then then the decision so uh, being decisive and being on time with the decision is uh, is, is crucial in, uh, in in ECMO uh, in ECMO management thank you thank you very much thank you it is past 11 I don't see the pedal um, so we have a short question. We wait for the pedal to enter, and at that time, um, Professor van der Horst has probably probably in the last final question. Yes, there is a technical problem with Zoom, and uh, people are getting thrown out of the meeting. So probably we close the meeting then without a pedal because it's already eleven o'clock. That's up to you, Mr. Prorector. Yeah, then I would say then we have now the aura est because it's two minutes past 11 and we go back to our conference room. I suspend the meeting and Mr. Kowalewski, the time for the defense has therefore passed even without the pedal, but the degree committee will now withdraw to discuss the quality of your thesis and your defense. And I request that you and your company await the results of our deliberation and our return. And I suspend the meeting.
Uh, Mr. Ko Kowalewski, I reopened this academic session to tell you that the degree committee uh, here present online has assessed the quality of your thesis and of your defense, and in view of its positive verdict and taking into account your previous qualifications, the degree committee has decided to grant you the degree of doctor. And Professor LaRusso is authorized to confer upon you this academic distinction in accordance with Dutch university custom. I invite your supervisor to now take the floor. Thank you, Mr. Prorector. So, uh, dear candidate, do you promise to work in accordance with the principles of scientific integrity at all times, to be careful and honest, transparent, independent, and responsible? Yes, I promise. By the authority vested in us by law and in conformity with the decision of the committee here present online, I hereby confer upon you, Marius Kowalewski, the degree of doctor and grant you all rights attached by custom and law. And as evidence of this, you will soon receive the degree certificate signed by the rector, the secretary, and the supervisor affixed with the official seal of the university, shown by the video. Thank you very much. I'm flattered. Thank you. Okay. So, Mr. Prorector, if you may allow me, I would like to express the University of Maastricht congratulation, the, super, the, the supervisor, the promoter and co promoters team, congratulations to you, your family, your friends, and your colleagues. So, dear Dr. Kowalewski, dear Marius, it looks like uh, yesterday that we were introduced, that you were introduced to me a few years ago by a common friend. You immediately showed me your interest and passion about clinical research and cardiac surgery in general. I believe that your attitude and approach, either in terms of commitment, but also in being so perfect in the teamwork and relating to the other people and researchers is unique and certainly represent your strongest value. Everybody likes working with you. And indeed the time and number of collaborations that you were able to build up and keep going has been impressive during this PhD research project time. I really appreciated working with you since you were always positive and you had the positive perception, kind of availability, sometimes I must admit to discuss apparently crazy ideas at crazy times of the day. But you have been always eager to accept advices, indications with your energy, which sometimes seems endless, despite being a busy surgeon in training and after training and a new father since a few months experiencing therefore the first, but also very beautiful times in such new roles. I strongly believe that your future clinical and scientific, I should say academic careers will be full of satisfaction and recognitions. So I wish also to thank publicly Professor Suvalski for keeping you busy, but also to represent for you an important reference and inspiring you be, being always curious and interested in new projects, new collaborations during your daily work. As I was delighted, as I said, working with you for the PhD pathway, I will also be delighted to continue the scientific and personal relationship with you, ensure that many relevant achievements are waiting, particularly for you, and as a brilliant mind and young resource for the cardiac surgery community. Besides the obvious congratulations to you and Professor Subalski, I would like to extend our, I mean the promotion team with Professor Mas and Dr. Bidar, congratulations to your family. And we were particularly happy to host you and your wife 
in Maastricht, and we hope that both of you will remember the period as an enjoyable and meaningful stay. Many PhD fellows of our research group are now collaborating with you and are all appreciating and highlighting the humble way you approach such collaborations. Please remain how you are, collecting experience in clinical as well in the scientific environments, but with this positive attitude and willingness to work with your peers. Remember, more fun is going to come, but also more responsibility. Young generation, particularly of surgeons, I, I must admit, are not approaching or even abandoning the research field due to the competitive aspects and the need of a lot of extra work and hours to be dedicated. I hope that your experience and your example will inspire some of your young peers to get in contact with these words of sacrifices, but also of satisfactions, always having in mind to practice both to improve patient care and knowledge. And the last suggestion, based on your proposition, you would like to have sex pistol related music in the operating room. I'm not so sure that this music would be the ideal atmosphere for a delicate anastomosis to be performed. I would advise more to be inspired by your incomparable compatriot Chopin. I'm, much, I'm sure that the personal working with you will appreciate and most likely the patients too. So again, congratulazzi, dear Marius, and really, you did a really fantastic job. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor LaRusso, for this uh, very nice and wise laudation. And uh, I would say, dear Dr. Kowalewski, also, on behalf of the Board of Deans, I congratulate, I congratulate you with the honor you have acquired. And uh, of course, I uh, congratulate also your supervisors, uh, Dr. Bidar, Professor Maas, and Professor Don Russo. I also congratulate your family, your wife, son, and other family and friends. And I would like to thank the members of the opposition for their, uh, uh, for their nice questions and their efforts to uh, to be here today. And of course, Luke Peters and the Padel for their technical support. Having said it all, I wish you a very great day, a great future. And I hope you can really celebrate this very important day in your scientific career. Having said it all, I hereby close this meeting.